like this you have to think how i'm how i'm gonna come to the results and how things will be done so it's it's uh, but it's it's good to have uh, What do you mean by what is noob actually? So some of you were able to understand, some of you were not able to understand. Uh, okay, okay, don't worry, don't worry. Uh, so we will come to the topic now of our uh, today's topic that is the markers so so this is basically uh, they are the DNA based markers uh, like RFLP, AFLP, RAPDs, SSRs, MAS, uh, which really helps to identify any disease state or any uh, uh, salt tolerant genes or uh, drought tolerant genes or any genes that you're looking for that is good for you uh, from the plant biology perspective or animal biology perspective. Um, they play a big role in that these all all markers yeah so we will start now uh, with the topic of today with the markers rflp flp so today's appendix will be we will talk about molecular markers some basic principles about how to detect them uh, then we will deal with the two types of markers one is based on the hybridization and one is on the based of pcr amplification then further uh, random amplified polymorphic DNA RAPD we will talk about and then AFLP AFLP so mainly uh, uh, RFLP and RAPD when they comes together uh, it's known as to be AFLP actually so and then uh, last not the least we will deal with the topic of your molecular marker assisted uh, selections So molecular marker is a DNA sequence in the genome uh, which can be located uh, and identified. Yeah, so you can locate it uh, anywhere in your protein and you can identify it to check to to check the mutations, insertions, deletions. So if whether there is any any change in the post translational modifications, PTMs are happened or not. So that's why it is done there. So base uh, composition at a particular location of the gene may be different from plants to plants. So the same particular location which has been deleted at one point which is inserted on the other but that would be different from plant to plant and this is collectively known as polymorphism and which can be mapped and identified. Again I will repeat uh, due to the results of genetic alterations the base compositions at particular location of genome may be different in different plants. And this, these differences collectively call as polymorphism. And plant breeders like to detect these molecular markers in order to solve many questions. Uh, further, these markers are also associated with the genes and inherited together. So why they are quite important, why they are highly reliable, why they are advantageous, why they are uh, into the plant breeding program. So mainly, they provide a true representations of genetic makeup at the DNA level. They are consistent of uh, they are they are consistent. They don't change with the, with much time, and they are not affected by the environmental factors. Uh, they are large numbers are present uh, as per your needs is required. So basic principle behind your molecular marker detection is let's say you have two plants. One is a disease plant. One is a disease resistance plants. Yeah. One is with the disease, one is without the disease. So uh, to check uh, the DNA marker that you can identify these two alleles. So there will be one DNA marker which, which could detect whether uh, the protein has disease or not. 
so then that could be done with the help of extraction of that DNA marker then digestion uh, by restriction enzyme and then separated by uh, gel electrophoresis so that's the basic principle that we will do in all of the uh, all the techniques of RFLP uh, RAPD and RF uh, AFLP that first we extract the genome uh, that you're looking for then it digested by the uh, restriction enzymes then separated by the gel electrophoresis then DNA fragments can be detected by their separation for instance disease resistance plants may have shorter DNA fragments while the disease sensitive plants may have longer DNA fragments so that's how we, we can we can differentiate between a disease state and the non-disease state that is the disease sensitive plants might be having a longer DNA fragments where the shorter DNA might be found in the uh, It's, it's a spelling mistake there. There's a uh, non-disease state. So they are divided into two parts, uh, DNA hybridization and PCR amplification. Sorry for the mistake. So here you can see one is disease sensitive plant, one is disease resistance plant, yeah, left and right. So this is uh, which it is more probable that it will get the disease. Then we extract the DNA from both. Then particularly with the restriction enzyme we ex uh, extract restrict them and then we have a shorter DNA and, and a longer DNA like this so that's the basic principle of your molecular markers that you will be studying so in each uh, semester or not in each in whether you're studying biochemistry or studying uh, molecular biology or biotechnology or any subjects related to life sciences these molecular markers is a quite a tough topic actually to understand what is their uh, advantages what are their disadvantages what are their applications what is the main difference between them so I try to uh, make as simplify as possible for you during these lectures so that you can tell even to your uh, uh, ninth class standard students or so so that's the uh, basic idea behind this lecture today. Um, DNA uh, piece can be cloned. So first is uh, the first part that we're going to deal here is today with the DNA hybridized, hybridized ones. So these ones are the one which can be cloned and allowed to hybridize with the genomic DNA. Yeah. So they are widely marker based uh, DNA hybridizations uh, are quite widely used and the major limitations to that one is that that you have to use a lot of dna lot of dna is required and use of uh, radioactivity so whenever you are doing an experiments uh, with the help of uh, radioactivity so you have to be taken care of yourself also because if once uh, while doing radioactivity work things could go really bad with you yeah so restriction fragment length polymorphism RFLP uh, that's the first uh, part in this DNA hybridization that is RFP was the first technology that was employed for the detection of uh, polymorphism based on the DNA sequence differences RFP is mainly based on the altered restriction enzyme states as a result of mutations and recombination of genomic DNA so an outline of RLP analysis uh, is shown in the next figure where we will be dealing with first again its basic principle isolation of genomic DNA then digestion by the restriction enzymes then separation by electrophoresis and then finally hybridization by incubating with the clone and label probes so let's check in the figure so that's what what I have explained you it's shown in the in the uh, the stepwise manner first you isolate it yeah then uh, digest by the restriction nucleus endonucleus uh, you can check the DNA pieces then separated by the gel electro uh, gel electrophoresis then these are transferred to this uh, membrane filter then they are incubated with the cloned and label probes then RFLP bands are detected so here is the example of this how you can check it uh, in this example so this is plant A and this is plant B yeah, there are two plants uh, whereas in the plant A uh, there is a loss of restriction sites for the E. coli 1 uh, but the HIN 3 is being present in both this restriction site is present in the both sites 
so that's the main difference between these two plants so when we digest it with the restriction enzymes uh, that is gel electrophoresis uh, so what you see is with enzyme hint 3 and e coli 1 uh, you see these results yeah so wh what what results that you see that uh, in the first pattern is the monomorphic pattern with the hint 3 that both genes has been restricted equally that a and b uh, a and b has both 200 base pairs 800 base pairs 200 base pairs 800 base pairs with the hint 3 because it is cut it from here only yeah after 200 800 will remain but with the e i 1 what you see is in the a uh, you don't see uh, any cut so it's remain at 1000 base pair but in the b you see these two different things and this is this is these results in the polymorphic pattern of separations in the b part yeah clear so plant a is digested plant b is not digested the same diagram like how is shown in the figure now you take the plant source you take the dna uh, with the help of friction digestions you check it with the electrophoric separations uh, then with the help of southern hybridization you check with the autoradiography how the results are how the results looks like so um uh, second part is uh, markers based on PCR amplifications. The first was the RFLP that is based on the uh, DNA hybridization. Now comes the PCR polymerase chain reaction, uh, which is a novel technique we know to amplify the DNA, uh, some selected reason. Uh, whereas the advantage is that within minutes we can increase a lot of DNA as yes, we know within 30 cycles and PCR markers requires only small quantity of DNA to start with but in the other case RFLP we need quite large amount in that case so within PCR based markers they can be divided into two parts that is RAPD and AFLP yeah which is uh, known as locus non-specific markers so there's a not specific local loci we see there's not so much specific uh, and within them RAPD's full form is random amplified polymorphic DNA so these questions but coming in a neat exam also and also in your gate exams so what are the different full form of them so please take care of uh, these these full forms also so it's amplified fragment length polymorphism for AFLP for RAPDs, random amplified uh, polymorphism DNA. So for the local specific are the one SSRs, SNPs, that is simple sequence repeats, single nucleotide polymorphism. So we will deal with them, all of them each by each. So, but you know, so what you can see in the uh, random amplified polymorphic DNA uh, in these markers, um, RAPD, it's, it's based on the, of course, first of all, PCR amplification. So what you can see here is first you isolate the genomic DNA, then you denature the DNA, then annealing of DNA is templated in with the primers, complementary uh, standard synthesis, then amplified products by gel electrophoresis are identified so after creating all these steps uh, your RAPD is is done in this case um, so what are the applications of RAPDs in plants it's actually helps you to distinguish between uh, different variety uh, based on their DNA sequence so whatever the DNA sequence is it can helps you to distinguish between different variety within the different plants so RAPD have been used to identify nearly 15 commercial sun sunflower varieties so within the sunflower they have found 15 uh, different varieties to be distinguished because of that uh, so here you can see that uh, for example DNA from plants allow the amplification of sequence A C D so ACDs are amplified uh, these genes but not B this indicates that in plant one primer sites for primer use not found at sequence B so ACD could be amplified because of the uh, with the help of primers but in the B it couldn't find it and similarly uh, so you can see here 
uh, for plant A, uh, A, C, D, they were sequenced. So that's why we saw different uh, protein, uh, this DNA level there. But in the second plant, it's not present for A and B, but it's only for C and D. But in the third plant, it's present for A and C and D. But in the in this fourth case, in the fourth variety, plant variety, it's present for the A and B only, and not for the C and D. So all this this results from the RAPD can distinguish different varieties according to the PCR we have done and 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 the results that what we saw there. So RAPDs are employed in construction of genetic maps. Yeah. Uh, including Arabtopsis and tobacco have been constructed. So whole genetic map uh, dealing with the genomic data has been constructed uh, because with the help of RAPD technique. It's also a direct selection of desirable uh, trait like whether you want to look for uh, any any breeding program that you're dealing with. Uh, you can deal to check uh, a specific marker like drought resistance marker. And then after selection of the desirable marker, you can go for further stages. So that's it, I guess. Yes, uh, this one, RP94G8 is also quite responsible for resistance to uh, stem rust in barley. So that, that marker has been also identified uh, to be several disease resistance genes in that thing. So that's also quite important. So this, similarly, heat smut resistance genes have been characterized also. Uh, so these are these 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 uh, quite quite important from to check the resistance against various diseases uh, in case of RAPDs. Um, further, in the uh, in the applications of uh, tissue culture. Uh, somatic hybrids also involved in the protoplast fusions uh, during the screening and they could help you to find out, exploitate, uh, identify somatic hybrids also. So these are various applications you can go through. But uh, some of the demerits that, that you have to think uh, taken care of are constraints about the reproducibility of the results like uh, the data that we are showing might be not reproduced again and again the same level and uh, none alleles are not directly detected and also RAPD, RAPD markers are dominant only half the genetic informations are co-dominant markers in this case so I will take just much of five minutes break now from 9 6 or we just meet at 9 11 now then yeah so we will continue this topic. Any questions so far? I can take your questions then maybe I can go ahead. What are you talking about, Bacho? Any questions? simple way of uh, DNA hybridization. So like we did yesterday in cloning, uh, we were hybridizing two DNA molecules uh, by bringing with the help of T, 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 T tails with the A, 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 A tail and we hybridize them together. So they got together. So that might be the way of doing it. alkaloid concentration in plants so you're coming to the flavonoids alkaloids uh, all phytochemical 
Yeah, uh, we just need to find that marker. So I am not sure about your question, but I will. I will. Um, that's good question actually. I will come to you uh, soon. I will write it down in my notebook. If somebody knows the answer, could could also uh, tell it here. How can molecular markers help us to increase the alkaloid concentration? Is there any marker find out so far which is quite related to the alkaloids? So if we can find that marker and we can overexpress that gene in the plant and we can have, yeah, we can increase the alkaloid concentration in that. So today we are more concerned with the plant biology in this case. This was very focused from the plant biology. But yes, molecular markers uh, are quite, quite, quite helpful in the, in the cancer field. Uh, also in the DNA fingerprinting we did yesterday. Okay guys, I will I will take a break now and see you in five minutes then at ten at nine fifteen then. Yo, okay.
so close I'm back uh, so let's continue so to talk about uh, molecular based on PCR amplification uh, as we continuing the topic uh, let's come to the now uh, AFLP so AFLP this is amplified fragment uh, length polymorphism which deals with the uh, combination of both RFLP that we have studied and ARRAPD. So both like the technique that we studied there with RFLP and, and RAPD. So we use both techniques together. That's that's the beauty of this ALFLP technique and is based on the principle of generation of DNA fragments using we also use restriction enzymes and also use oligo, uh, oligonucleotide adapters that is linkers and also and we do afterwards the amplification by PCR so it's a combination you can see restriction enzymes were used in the first case with the uh, RFLP in the RAPD we did the PCR so this technique is combination usefulness of, a, of your both restriction digestion enzymes and PCR so both are being used uh, quite nicely in this case and DNA the genome is extracted it is subjected to uh, go for restriction digestions using two enzymes the rare cutter is MSC1 and also frequent cutter that is E. coli 1 so and you guys know how we give their name actually so E. coli this is E. coli strain is R and stipe is 1 that's how the uh, nomenclature of e these restriction enzyme is done here is also this is I'm not sure yet but uh, the type is one also here uh, this is no, I'm not sure sorry for that uh, if somebody knows please tell in the comments so now in this case PCI is now performed in the pre-selection of fragment of DNA before the selection the fragment PCI is done which has single specific nucleotide by this we can pre-select what you are looking for and three nucleotide sequence are amplified this further reduces the pool of DNA fragments to manageable level and audio radiograph is done and detection of the fragments afterwards so use of radio label primers and fluorescently labeled fragment farmers quickens the AFLP so we use here radio label markers uh, primers actually to make that things done quickly so this is the basic mechanism uh, of this uh, that is uh, yeah you have your DNA molecule here where uh, we add restriction enzyme uh, E. coli 1 and MSC 1 so left side it cut from 6, six cutter uh, and on the on the right side MSC 1 will cut on the right side at fourth cutter so you can see after adding the restriction enzyme so we have left is C T T A G A A C so it's cut at the A part here and on the right side it cut at the fourth part from here A A T so we have cat left so C A T A and on this side is C T T A G G A C um, so it's 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 done after after cutting it uh, after cutting it then we add ligation uh, with linker so linkers are added to this so here so after the cut uh, cut of it oops so C T A and C T T G so ligations are added on both sides then uh, PCR is done for employing a single nucleotide extension so for the single nucleotide uh, let's say from here we have this our now linkers added to it now from CTTG on the top we will add one primer and PCR will be run uh, in front of it uh, and then with the PCR we can keep increasing that 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 thing going on so this is how AFLP is done so this is a right diagram showing a simple uh, manner of doing so with linker adapters adding non-specific more primers and performing a PCR to this so AFLP is primarily used in genetic mapping uh, also important for cereal crops like rice barley and wheat which has been mapped uh, by the AFLPOs only and different 
and AR50 markers have produced different combination of restriction enzymes actually. So in, BA, in barley, AR50 markers are located on the long and short arm of all seven chromosomes. So in barley, AR50 markers are on the long and short of all the seven uh, chromosomes uh, in the barley case. And also they exhibit a strong relationship between number of markers per chromosome and length of the chromosome. So how many chromosomes are present per marker and how, how much is the length. So similarly in rice, uh, when a cross was done between Indica and ya uh, Japonica and it reveals 50 AFLP markers, they were present on every chromosome except in the small chromosome 12. So that's how ALFLP uh, is so advantageous to us. So please go through its uh, applications further. So what are the merits? So you can screen large number of polymorphism, which was not possible before in other techniques. So you can screen a lot of uh, difference in the in the gene pattern, and it is also possible to uh, identify map-based cloning of targeted genes. Uh, it helps to identify quantitative traits in barley and rice. Uh, it's also used to screen pools of plasmid DNA of several clones, enabling uh, rapid isolation of genes tightly linked to the markers. And furthermore, last not the least, uh, it's it's being ra most rapidly preferred molecular technique for several different investigations, particularly uh, in many areas of research. So some demerits, uh, so SCAR we will discuss about this now, null allele cannot be detected. So if there is a null allele without any effect to it, it it's not possible to identify it. So it's a proprietary technique. So once you get the right to it, then no one can change that. Uh, furthermore, require high amount of DNA that required in RAPD. Relatively expensive owing to experiments of silver staining. Uh, so yeah, it's expensive because uh, we are using a radio and non-label uh, pathway to go for. Now we are coming to the end, mostly end part of your topic of markers with the STS and uh, SCARs and SSRs. So let's discuss about uh, sequence tag sites. Uh, sequence tag sites represents a unique simple co uh, copy segments of genomes. Uh, let's say simple nucleotide repeats G A G T C A A. They are present on the genome. ST have been recently developed in plants. Uh, when STS uh, loci contain simple sequence length polymorphism S S L L P. Yeah, uh, they are highly valuable as molecular markers. STS loci have been analyzed and studied in number of plant species. Uh, furthermore, microsatellites, they are tendonally repeated multiple copies of mono, di, tri, tetra, nucleotide motifs. Yeah. So they are tandemly repeated multi copies uh, of mono, di, tri, tetra, nucleotide motifs. In some instances, flanking sequence of uh, repeat sequences may be unique. And they are also to, they are also known to detect sequence tag microsatellites. So if, if there's any microsatellites with sequence tag to it, and this could be checked by PCR only. So we already talked about sequence. Uh, then comes the SCAR, sequence characterized uh, amplified regions. Though so they are the modified form of the STS markers, and they are developed by the uh, PCR primers that are made of the RAPD fragments. So STS uh, converted RAPD markers are sometimes referred to SCARs and SCARs are useful for the rapid development, development of STS markers. So sequence characterized amplified regions. Uh, SCARs are modified forms of STS markers and they are developed. Uh, this we have discussed uh, in the demerits, remember, of the AFLPs. So they are developed by the PCR markers and made up of the ends of the RAPD markers, RAPD also and PCR markers. So you can see this is an amplified RAPD band here and then amplified a scar with the primer. Then it is amplified with the scar further with the primer in that case. 
so some of the applications of it so how they are helpful please go through them like they can help to tolerate abart stresses qualitative and quantitative traits resistance to many uh, pathogens and insects so they have quite large number of applications as compared to the also rapd and aflp and uh, uh, rflp rapd and aflp uh, and they have quite a number of advantages because you can select markers for desired traits which uh, can be detected well in advance and you can plan experiments how you want to go for your, your experiments yeah so following are the major uh, requirements for molecular mark selection plant breeding that is they should be closely linked with the desired trait uh, whatever the things that you're looking for they should be quite closely linked to your desired trade it should be efficient reproducible and easy to carry out and analysis has to be economical also now this is i i just uh, touch this topic a little bit for you molecular breeding that is uh, to yield uh, to yield a, a, a plant species uh, which has uh, you can you can create a new species after the breeding many many cycles so you can create a, a dwarf and semi dwarf varieties of rice and weeds uh, which was done during the green revolution and it has a much you can also improve the grain yield and cereal production uh, after some time with it you can also uh, maintain the quality of the seeds also whether you want seeds to be uh, in in the barley there is a six uh, six uh, sided on both side uh, they are growing in some cases they are only single sided they, they are growing so there are many things that you can do with the uh, plant breeding uh, linkage analysis is also quite important it's basically deals with the study to correlate a link between a molecular marker and desired trait that how a molecular marker that you, that you have identified is quite uh, quite uh, similar to the uh, trade that you are looking for and it's quite an important aspect of for you for the people who are working with the breeding programs uh, it has to be done in several populations several generations for appro appropriate linkages uh, in early uh, in earlier years uh, uh, linkage was carried out by use of isoenzymes and associated of polymorphisms and molecular markers are now being used for the same Ah, this is quite important uh, quantitative trait loci QTL sorry students today is a lot of text in this but this is a subjective actually very subjective uh, workshop today where you have to understand these terms their meaning what is the main basic principle behind it just go through the diagram and some little bit of applications that will be uh, enough enough for you actually from the molecular markers point of view uh, in plant with respect to plant only so quantitative trait loci there are many characteristics controlled by several genes in complex manner some good examples are uh, growth habit yield adaptability to environment disease resistance so these all aspects could be dealt with the qtls uh, and when i was doing in my masters in agrobiotechnology uh, so these qtls were quite hot at that time so the scientists were looking for many QTLs so they can grow. Uh, basically, they were uh, looking for QTLs in the uh, canola, canola oil that uh, produced by the Rapa, Rapa, I guess, uh, Rapa. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. Maybe Rapa one was the one uh, from the Rapa seeds. So they have but they have major problem the plant breeder faces now to how to improve complex characters controlled by many genes it is not easy job to manipulate multiple genes and genetic engineering therefore it is very difficult to and time consuming also for example golden rice which was enriched with the pro vitamin a uh, involved insertion of just three genes to took about seven years so it took them around seven years uh, to 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 be present uh, to us So thank you students uh, for being there. So uh, that's it for, for the molecular markers point of view. Thank you very much.
so next topic uh, I would like to start is uh, okay Okay, so take some break and then we continue or we start we have only 30 minutes left uh, I have to be we hurry today with the restriction enzymes sorry students today is subjective part uh, that is highly subjective uh, but uh, I will I will bring it more tomorrow for you. Don't worry, don't worry. So restriction enzymes. So as we have discussed multiple zillion million trillion times about restriction enzymes, how uh, they are important, how they can uh, they can cut they can cut uh, our uh, required desired plasmids desired genes and let let it be fitted to the plasmid so they are quite important so I just thought to bring this topic also to touch with you if we have discussed about cloning so far so even though today day was for us a uh, protein isolation purification and quantification uh, I want to add because somebody was asking me to add some uh, some to calculate the thing so I want to do some some maths with you for the same uh, um, I'm preparing some slides extra slides for that so that's why I was not able to bring that slides for today but I still have these slides left for you uh, so I want to finish with them first and then maybe tomorrow we can have two sessions together tomorrow is a session of I guess day six uh, I think it was maybe gel electrophoresis so we can have two sessions together tomorrow with the proton uh, protein isolation and gel electrophoresis so don't worry whatever the content that I have shown you that will be done for sure but my uh, my each day uh, is like that I can bring you something new something more something better uh, so that uh, you take some good lessons out of it that's that's my main main reason is that's nothing nothing much so in order to do so let's have our next session with the restriction enzymes so I will start uh, so this topic will be uh, divided into following parts that is introduction uh, mode of action star activity nomenclature of restriction enzymes type of restriction enzymes dna ligase uh, kinases and phosphatases reverse transcriptase and clino fragments so all these topics will be dealt today uh, if if we are if we still have time afterwards i have one virtual lab for you today with the molecular cloning of mice actually so I will show you how you can do the molecular cloning of the mice in that case if we still have some time today yeah so let's start so the ability to manipulate DNA uh, in vitro depends entirely on the ability of availability of purified enzymes so like they can cleave modify and, and join the DNA molecule in the specific way so various enzymes used in genetic engineering are as follows that is uh, nucleases restriction enzymes dna ligase kinase phosphatase uh, reverse transcriptase terminal deoxynucleotide uh, transferase rnas just get, get, wait a second let me have some water students carry on so we will discuss each of them one by one today
so first is uh, nucleases they are the group of enzymes which cleave or cut the genetic material of your dna or rna yeah so dna's and rna's uh, they are the uh, one of the nucleases that they are working for and they are further classified into two substrates which they can act either they can uh, act on or cut the DNA are classified as DNases which work on the RNA they are known as the RNases so DNA is further divided into two parts upon the position they cut that is exo and endo exo the ones which cuts at the end whereas endo is the one that cuts at the center of your DNA exonucleases requires DNA strands with at least a 5 prime to 3 prime end uh, and and they cannot act on the DNA which is circular but endonucleases are one which are the one which can act on the circular DNA and they do not require any free uh, DNA ends so that's the main difference between exo and endo and beyond that exonucleases releases nucleotides such as nucleic acid sugar and phosphate whereas endonucleases releases short segments of DNA Furthermore, DNA which act on specific positions or sequence on the DNA, they are called restriction endonucleases. Yeah, restriction endonucleases are the one uh, which specifically cut and they are also known as restriction enzymes. These sequences are palindromic sequences, we already know which has the same name like auto, we have discussed it also before. And they are present in different bacteria, can recognize different sites, some section sites, but they will cut at two different points within section sites. Such section enzymes are called isosomers. So there are no two section enzymes for, from a single bacterium will cut at the same section site. So the section enzymes binds to the recognition sites and check for the methylation. Uh, that is presence of methyl group on DNA at specific nucleotide. So how how what is the main reason how they work is that they ch check for the methylation. If methylation is working, then they will not cut. If this methylation is not happening, then they will cut. So if only one strand in DNA molecule is methylated, yeah, in the recognition sequence, and other strand is not methylated, then RE will methylate in the other strand at the required position. The methyl group is taken by the RE from s adenosyl methionine by using modification sites present in the restriction enzymes. However, the type 2 restriction enzymes take the help of another enzymes like methylase and methylate the DNA. So that's the main difference between here our type 1, 2 and type, uh, type 3. So RE restriction enzyme here cleaves the DNA and there is no methylation is happening on both strands of DNA whereas RE cleaves the DNA. So that's about methylation activity and there is a thing called star activity uh, which you might be not aware of. Star activity in the field of uh, restriction enzymes. There are sometimes restriction enzymes recognize and cleave the DNA strands at the recognition sites with asymmetrical pal palindromic sequences. Uh, such as for example palm H1 cuts at sequence GATCC but under extreme conditions, it cuts at the lo uh, low ionic strength, that is uh, NGATCC, GPOTCC, GG, and so this is something uh, very unusual cutting of your DNA. So here it's called as star activity. Okay, so next is uh, nomenclature. How you uh, write down the name of the uh, restriction enzymes? It was given by the Smith and Natans in 1973. Yeah. It was given by Smith and uh, Rations by 1973. Um, so they have specific names so that everyone could be identified with the unique name. So in that case, the first three letters should be in italics and indicates the biological source of enzymes. So in case of, let's say, uh, Asterisia coli, so ECO, first three names, uh, first would be the genus name and second two names will be the species names, two letters. If it is Haemophilus influenzae, then first letter will be the genus name, the second two name will be of species name. Diplococcus pneumonia, so DPN, D from the species name, oh sorry, uh, genus name and pneumonia, PN from the, uh, from your 
species name. So that's how hen, E. coli, DPN, bomb, uh, H1. So all these names are given. Then the next name is, then comes the letter identify which the strain of bacteria that you're looking for. That is E. coli R for strain R. So strain was bacteria was R. So that's why it's R. And finally, there's a Roman numeral, like which particular enzyme that you are looking for, which particular question that you're looking for the strain. So for the first enzyme, it will be one numeral. And the, for the second, it will be two numeral. So E. coli 1, E. coli 2, like this. So restriction endonucleases can be divided into three groups. Uh, that is 1, 2, and 3, uh, whereas type 1 and 3 have an ATP-dependent restriction activity and a modification activity resistant in the same multimeric protein, okay? And both these types recognize unmethylated recognition sequence in the DNA. Whereas a type 1 enzyme cleave the DNA at random sites, it's cleave anywhere, whereas type 3 cleave at very specific site. Okay, type 2 restriction modification system possess separate enzymes for endonucleases, whereas methylase activity are the most widely used for the genetic manipulation. So, type 1 restriction enzymes, uh, these type of uh, these restriction enzymes recognize a uh, recognition site but cleave the DNA somewhere between 400 base pair to 10,000 base pairs. Okay, and 10 kilo base pairs to the right or to the left. The cleavage site is not specific. But the enzymes that you use, there are three peptides and multiple equations, and the enzymes also require magnesium ions, ATP, and S adenosyl methionine for the cleavage. So these are type 1, and for the type 2 restriction enzymes, restriction enzyme of these type recognize the restriction sites and cleave the DNA within the recognition sites of sequence. So they cleave it within within the limits and they require magnesium ions for as a cofactor for cleavage activity and can generate PO4, uh, 5 prime and PO4 and 3 prime and hydroxyl group. They are quite important because of their quite speci high specificity, specificity and they could be further uh, divided into two types that is blend end cut, blunt end cutters and cohesive end cutters. So blend end cut cutters are the one that cut the strands at the same point on the both strands of the DNA. So blunt ends we know that both sides they are the equal, uh, equal number of uh, uh, your your base pairs and the DNA cell strands uh, such fragments are blunt ended or flush ended. Uh, whereas the cohesive ends are the one uh, which cuts uh, class cuts at the different points of the on both strands of DNA within the recognition sequence. So they generate a short single stranded sequence at the end. So they are this this short single stranded sequence is called sticky or cohesive ends, and they are known as PO4 and and 3OH like this way. Uh, last not the least, type 3 restriction enzymes they recognize the recognition sites but cut the DNA one kilo base pairs away from the restriction sites. These enzymes are made up of two peptides or subunits. These enzymes require ATP, magnesium, S adenosyl methionine. So they, they require these three uh, sub factors also to function like properly. So this is uh, a summary of what we have studied uh, so far in a nice stable manner. Uh, that is uh, structure, how the structure looks like, composition. What are the difference in the composition? What are the cofactors that are required? Mostly, uh, in all of them, you need magnesium, SAM, uh, and ATP. In the second, ATP is not required. Uh, then recognition sites, where they, they are attached to it. Then cleavage sites, where the cleavage sites looks like. So some of them example where they cut, where they work actually, MBOL, uh, DPN, SAW, 3AI, uh, 3 base cutters, 8 base cutters, 4 base cutters. So you can use any of, of your enzymes as per your needs actually are. This we also did before in previous presentations. Then comes the DNA ligase. Uh, this DNA ligase is actually helps to join 
covalently two two phosphodiester bonds between resistant nucleotides. That's the main part of it. So recombinant DNA experiments require joining of two different DNAs. So in that case, DNA ligase is being used. The cohesive ends generated by restriction enzymes uh, will anneal themselves by forming a hydrogen bond. They come and join together using the hydrogen bond and that's why uh, they could withstand with experimental conditions also uh, further uh, in this case uh, dna uh, ligase is isolated from the e coli and t4 bacteriophage which is widely used and t4 ligase uh, there's also t4 ligase which requires atp as a cofactor and e coli requires nadp as a cofactor so all these things uh, work work in that case for them so last uh, in the mostly in last slides we are now in the kinases is a group of enzymes uh, which adds a free pyrophosphate so they are free pyrophosphate are added to the substrate like protein dna and rna where on the case of phosphatases uh, they remove the phosphatase actually so kinases add phosphate phosphatases remove so they work like yin yang uh like in the chinese uh, way so one is doing another way is uh, not doing the opposite of it that remember that uh, dark one is like this other should be like this so this will be dark and this should be whole dark so this is like yin yang totally opposite of each other uh, it uses ATP as a cofactor and adds phosphate by breaking the ATP into ADP and pyrophosphate. So it's being used in various uh, fields also. And then comes the phosphatases. As I told you, it's removed the phosphate from the variety of substrates like DNA, RNA and proteins. Uh, and the, basically they act in the uh, buffer of pH 8 and 9. That's why they are called as alkaline phosphatases. So most commonly alkaline phosphatases are uh, BAP and CIP that is bacterial alkaline phosphatases and calf intestine alkaline phosphatases. And there is also shrimp alkaline phosphatases which are used in various molecular cloning experiments. So they are also known as metalloenzymes because they have zinc ions into them. Okay, so BAP, uh, is, BAP is, is a dimer containing six zinc ions two of which are essential for enzymatic activity and BAP is very stable and not inactivated by heat and any detergents whereas CIP is also a dimer and it requires zinc and magnesium ions for actions where CIP is inactivated by heating at 700 degrees Celsius for 20 minutes or in the presence of a 10 millimeter EGTA so Reverse transcriptase, uh, as the name suggests, this enzyme uses an RNA molecule as a template and synthesizes a DNA strand complemented to your RNA molecule. So these enzymes are used to synthesize DNA from RNA. So we know we we had studied about this. If we go back from RNA to DNA, uh, so in that case we use reverse transcriptase. And they are mostly present in, in the RNA tumor viruses and retroviruses and reverse transcriptase enzymes is also called as RNA dependent uh, DNA polymerase. Okay. And reverse transcriptase enzymes after synthesizing, uh, they are called as complementary strands at the end of three prime three and three prime end of the DNA strand and called as small extra nucleotide stretch. So this is uh, about uh, terminal deoxynucleotide transferase and RNAPs. So terminal deoxynucleotide transferase is a polymer which adds nucleotides at the three prime end. That is known as a clinoe uh, fragment. Whenever a polymerase is a polymerase add a nucleotide at the three prime end, uh, known as clinoe uh, cl clinoe fragment, but does not require any complementary sequence and does not copy any DNA sequence. So this is known as your TDNT. Uh, which adds nucleotide whatever come in its active site it does not show any preference for any nucleotides uh, now further RNA piece it specifically cleaves at the 5 prime end at RNA it's a complex enzyme consisting of small proteins 
uh, around 307 nucleotide RNA molecules into this. So example is ribozyme. This we have discussed uh, just now, clino fragments. So thank you guys. Uh, I think we are done with the this this workshop of today. So I will not take you much time to take you to the next slide. Not not slides. Slides are enough for you today, but. Uh, Uh, a cloning virtual lab because we have discussed various markers various cloning restriction enzymes and today our recombinant uh, DNA technology is finished today uh, with, with so much of uh, so much of slides animations videos uh, I don't know some practical knowledge uh, we did we did a lot we did a lot now it's come to do some have some fun now to enjoy our last slide uh, with this uh, uh, click and clone workshop so here we will be studying about somatic cell nuclear transfer so this is what you see uh, in most of the uh, yeah, quite common uh, videos in TV that how uh, clone mice is produced how a clone uh, cloning is done in the humans also or well, human is not allowed it's not ethical uh, but how you can produce babies uh, with, with this artificial way of cloning so let's start to the mouse cloning lab so we will clone a mouse today in this case uh, let's start with it so to do the cloning what do we need so you need a Mimi mouse a Magdo mouse, a Mommy mouse. So we need three mouse. Mimi mouse, uh, we clone is is in brown in color. Magdo, uh, which will carry the egg, uh, which will egg cell donor, which is egg cell donor, is a black, and she is a, uh, the white one is a surrogate mother to grow Mimi clone. So she will grow the Mimi clone. That is the white one. And we need some petri dishes. We need some microscope. Uh, we need some sharp pipettes, blunt pipettes. Yeah, blunt pipettes are also important here. And chemical to stimulate cell division, uh, to cell division. So let's start. So these are the various traps. So there will be six steps. Just a second. Uh, first case would be to isolate a donor cell from Mimi uh, uh, and Magdo. Second would be remove and discard the nucleus from the egg cells. Third would be the transfer of the somatic cell nucleus into the uh, enucleated egg cells. Then the stimulating the cell division, then implanting the embryo into Mimi. Uh, then the surrogate mother, then deliver the baby mouse clone of Mimi. Uh, it looks quite long steps, but they will be very interesting and uh, good to go for. Okay, let's clone. So here, what you can see, uh, this is a Mimi mouse. This is Magdo mouse. Okay, um, remove and click drag the somatic cells of Mimi and X cells in Magdo dish. Okay, so we remove the Mimi cells, egg cells, uh, into the somatic cells, and we remove the Magdo uh, egg cells from Magdo here. So somatic cells from the mommy and Magdo, the egg cells are there. So what, now we remove and discard the nucleus from the each egg cells. From each egg cells, now it's time to remove there the nucleus so let's move the petri dish so i will put the excel petri dish first there in the microscope so here what you have to do is uh, use with the help of blunt pipette 
you attached it so it's like suck it uh, it sucked the nucleus and you have to uh, take the sharp pipette and suck the nucleus from the cytoplasm so egg cell is now X nucleated so it doesn't have any egg now uh, transfer the somatic cell nucleus into the enucleated egg cell so now I will remove this uh, this cells to here and now I will bring this one oops sorry I will now add a uh, somatic cells to the nuclear transfer dish now I will transfer the nucleus from the somatic cell into the enucleated egg cells to do so let's bring it to the so understanding guys so there was egg uh, from one mother we got the egg from other mother we got the somatic cells and then now uh, we removed from the magdo mother the nucleus so it become empty now from the somatic cells of other mother we will add the nucleus of her so first of all the blunt end then sharp pipette to remove the nucleus of her somatic cells and then added egg cells so we wait for the egg to work out now that you have substituted the egg nucleus to the other one uh, the egg cells need some time to adjust with one another so they will take some time so we rebooted and uh, run it quite fast a couple of hours so let's go for the next step so now we will stimulate because it's very hard uh, to do to the start the mitosis here so we will start with the add a chemical to fertilize the cells further so that the mitosis could start so the cell starts to divide a lot we stimulate it and we so you can see here uh, it started to create a ball then morula and 16 cells in a petri dish so this takes several hours but it's done now let's go for the next step so place the embryo in the womb of mommy we will bring this and surrogate mother we will implant this embryo to her so embryo continues to increase in size in cell number it begins to differentiate uh, into various tissue types so pregnancy will continue for 19 days in the mice so now let's deliver the mommy but mommy uh, child so what do you say uh, so we added somatic cell from the nuclear donor and we added to the enucleated egg of cell donor and then we surrogate the mother which color uh, will I be which color should I be then will it will I be white will I be brown or will I be black tell me I got nucleus from where I got nucleus from where yes it is brown yes because pup genetic material came from Mimi she's too is brown mouse so we can call her mini Mimi <laughs> we call her mini Mimi so this experiments that I have shown you th this has actually really happened uh, in reality so in, in 1980 uh, uh, this procedure has been done uh, based on the research protocol 
uh, which has several uh, landmark on on a cloning. So in 1998, scientists at the University of Hawaii made these mice genetically identical to the mice from which cumulus donor cell was taken, and the first bone survivor named was known as Cumulina. And the scientists learned that the allowing between one or six hours for newly transferred nucleus to adjust and ex-nucleated ex was crucial before.